Thank you for joining us for our Ash Wednesday service this evening. I was excited when Pastor Lewis told me that I would be preaching. I emailed my former pastor and boss in California, the Reverend Dr. Gary Cummins, and asked him for some advice, and he is Episcopalian. And he said, Marcus, if you was going to be preaching at St. Luke's, I would tell you to preach about holiness. But since you will be preaching in the Presbyterian Church, you must preach about sin. <laughs> I told the good doctor that the reason I converted was not because of sin or holiness, but more so it was easier for me to pronounce the word Presbyterian than it was Episcopalian. Our scripture this morning, excuse me, our scripture this afternoon will be taken from Luke, the 18th chapter, verses 9 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord. To some who were confident of their own righteousness, look down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. He said, God, you know that I am not like other men. I'm not a robber, evildoer, an adulterer, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. For this is the word of the Lord. I am reminded of a story I was told of a man that was in a terrible car accident. His wife was called and she pleaded with him to be seen by a doctor. The man replied, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. The paramedics were called and said, sir, you've just been in a bad car accident. Your car's total, you're bleeding, you have deep bruises. There may be eternal damage inside. The man replied, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. At least have a doctor check you out, sir. It wouldn't take very long. I told you, there is nothing wrong with me. So the man walked away and his wife drove him home. And later that evening, the man died. He had eternal bleeding and damage inside. There are times in our lives when we say, everything's fine. There's nothing wrong with me. This illustration is playing out in our scripture today. Let's look at the Pharisee first. Remember, the Pharisee were the clean-cut, wealthy people who proclaimed their own self-righteousness. He went up to the temple to pray for himself. Now, friends, there is nothing wrong with praying for yourself. Many times I find myself down on bended knees. There are times in my life where I need to go to God in prayer. But the Pharisee was feeling just a little bit overconfident. I am not like these people. I'm not a robber. I'm not an even doer. I don't cheat on my wife, and I am definitely not like this guy over here. Maybe he was right. He was a good guy, obeyed the law, lived a moral life, gave 10% of all his tithes to the church, which you should do, by the way. <laughs> Fasted twice a week and prayed. On the surface level, looks pretty good. Now let's look at the tax collector. Think of this guy like the IRS. You don't like him. They tax your money, they take your money, and then they spend your money. The tax collector was the opposite of the Pharisee. He was stealing, 
ruining people's lives, just living it up. He knew his life was a disaster. Jesus said that the tax collector was so ashamed of his sin that he would not even look up to heaven. He wouldn't even go to the front of the temple. He was ashamed, had guilt, had cheated people, and all he could say is, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Two men, they go up to the temple, two prayers, and the prayers were opposite of each other. The Pharisee was praying, Lord, there's nothing wrong with me. And the tax collector was saying, Lord, there's everything wrong with me. Sometimes we get caught up in our own self-righteousness. We lose sight on what's going on inside, what God wants to do eternally. Just recently, if you've been watching the news, in my hometown of Los Angeles, California, there has been targeted killings of LAPD officers and a massive manhunt for a former police officer who was determined to prove his own innocence, his own self-righteousness, to the point where he was willing to take the lives of innocent people, even two of his former officers. He was so determined and shouting, there's nothing wrong with me. I was fired unjustly. You terminated me without cause. That he failed to deal with what was going on inside his soul. Let's look at verse 14. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus seems to indicate that the humbled man's sins were forgiven and he went home justified. What exactly is Jesus saying here? Is Jesus saying that you can earn forgiveness for your sins by just being humble? Could it be that the depth of our humility can forgive us for all the things that we do? Running a red light, throwing the bird at someone that driving too fast, the pastor didn't preach a good sermon, sent a hateful email. Paul says in Romans 5.20, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Paul even continues in Romans 6, 1, what shall we do then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may increase? Paul said, by no means. You see, friends, neither the Pharisee nor the tax collector deserved God's forgiveness. The Pharisee, because he was conceited, prideful, self-righteous, comes strolling in right up to the temple, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm good. I pay my tithes. I do my dues. I pray. I fast. I'm good. The tax collector was the opposite. He went in, but he had a litany of sins. I curse. I gossip. I steal. I cheat. I plagiarize. I look at porn. I don't like my wife. I beat my kids. Here's all my sins. Friends, we are forgiven by God's grace and by his mercy. We are forgiven because Jesus paid the price on Calvary for our sins. We are forgiven because he loves us. As a youth director, my main goal is to teach kids about this love, about how their sins are forgiven because Jesus gave his life. There's nothing too small or too big that Jesus can't handle. Jesus gives grace that doesn't appear anywhere else. We try to find it in other things. We try to find it with drugs. We try to find it in gambling. We try to find it in alcohol. We even try to find it in being spiritually religious on the outside, but yet there's no depth in the inside. Every Monday night, I have a unique opportunity to explain to our youth about God's 
unconditional love, his unfailing grace, his endless mercy. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You just open up your hands and you receive it. The Bible says it is the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassion faileth not. They are renewed daily. It says every morning, great is thy faithfulness. Limitations, the third chapter, 22 and 23. On Mondays, I get kids who come to me and confess their deepest and darkest sins and asking to be led to the cross. I also get kids who have the appearance of being okay, but deep inside, they have wounds that have not healed. They have scars that they carry around. They have baggage that they don't know where to lay down. There's eternal bleeding. Some of them are bleeding out quickly. And for others, it's a slow and painful death. I know some of you can relate. Some of you have experienced hardship. Some of you have experienced hardship through the economy, hardships in your marriage. Sometimes we fall on troubling times. That same grace and that same love and that same mercy and that same forgiveness is there for the teens when they're 12 through 18. And it's there for the adults when you're 19 to 150. I get kids with this eternal bleeding that tries to cope with the drugs and alcohol or with the money. But friends, it can only be healed by the blood of Jesus. In this story, God offered forgiveness and mercy to both the Pharisee and the tax collector. But only the tax collector received it. God forgives people purely out of his mercy. Because of his mercy, God chooses to forgive those who humble themselves before him. Those who stand before God and say, there is everything wrong with me. My marriage is failing, my kids are out of control, my prayer life is down the toilet, and I need you, Lord. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mercy is given to those who recognize their sin, who recognize their needs for God's help, who recognize their own eternal damage and brokenness. The humble tax collector is a picture of what Lent is. The prideful Pharisee is the opposite of Lent. Which one are you? How will you observe this year Lenten season? Do you plan to act extra religious for 40 days? Give up your Mexican food, give up your chocolate, or will you use the time to be healed, to be restored? Many people observe Lent that way. I will no longer eat chocolate for 40 days. I will no longer curse or drink for 40 days. I will no longer watch sports for 40 days. Look how religious I am, Lord. Do you love me more now? God must be happy for I have given something up for him for four day, 40 days. Is Lent a time of self-denial or self-reflection? It is okay to self-deny oneself for discipline. For God says he disciplines those whom he loves. If there's anything that's in your life that consumes you, by all means, my brothers and my sisters, you can lay it down at the cross for 40 days. But I would challenge you to use the time for self-reflection, repentance, healing of wounds that's so deep that God's grace and love and mercy just want to immerse you in. Jesus is more concerned with what is going on inside of your heart. 
Lent is a time, my friend, to give up sin. It is a time to give up hypocrisy, acting like a Christian on the outside, but being prideful or self-righteous on the inside. For me, there was times in my life where I was very prideful and arrogant and self-righteous. And sometimes I would fight with the Lord and I did not want to see what was in the mirror. But when God has a hold of you and he wants you to have his love and his grace and his mercy and you see how wonderful it is, you have to decide and make a conscious effort to change, stay the course. And when you stay the course, it will be painful. But I am a living witness that joy comes in the morning. As the tax collector walked away being justified, he no longer had to deal with the guilt and the shame of his sin. The cool thing about being a Christian is once God has forgiven you, my friends, you are forgiven. Lent is an attitude. It's okay to give up the chocolate and the sports but it's an attitude of honesty and humility as we confess our sins to God. And Lent is also about the release and having joy, knowing that our sins has been forgiven. The slate is clean. There is no more going back. He says, I have forgiven you so much that I have taken your sins and casting them down to the depths of the sea, never to be reminded no more. If we desire to do this Christian walk right, these ashes should say we are dead to the world, but alive in Christ. We are exiled and wandering the earth doing ministry, telling our friends and our coworkers, our neighbors about the goodness and the grace of the Lord. Sometimes we find ourselves fighting endless spiritual battles and Things come and things go. I get that. Life's messy. Sin's messy. And we need time to recover. Friends, I invite you to take time during the Lenten season to recover, to be restored, to be redeemed, to lay down the baggage or the heavy burdens you've been carrying around, to take some time and to enjoy the peace that the Lord gives. Ash Wednesday is a wonderful wake-up call for spiritual spring cleaning, even if the spiritual work is a little heavy and messy. The smearing on the ashes on the forehead is an outward sign of repentance, of belonging, of self-revelation that I belong to Christ. As for me, the next 40 days is a time of healing. For I am a sinner in need of God's mercy. So instead of me shouting, there is nothing wrong with me, I shout, Lord, have mercy on me.